I'm Laura Bontempo from the University of Maryland. We're going to be talking about trach emergencies, what could possibly go wrong when you're breathing through a hole in your neck. I have no disclosures. Greater than 100,000 trachs are placed annually in the United States, and most of those patients do just fine. But about 1%, about 1,000 patients per year, have catastrophic events related to their trach. And of those 1,000 patients, about half will die. So we need to be prepared when these patients show up in our emergency departments. Trach emergencies are generally divided into three groups. They're the intraoperative emergencies, the early postoperative, and the late postoperative emergencies. Obviously, this group isn't going to be concerned about the intraoperative emergencies, but even in my short PK time frame, I decided it was worth highlighting one of the intraoperative complications, and that is, yes, intraoperative fire. So when you go to get your trach placed, the fifth greatest risk to your well-being is that your surgeon's going to set you on fire. Let me just run that past you, okay? So besides for entertainment purposes, that's not going to, what's going to worry us. We're going to focus on the two main killers, and that is obstruction and hemorrhage. Obstruction. Well, what can block the tube? Gunk. Gunk and yuck can block the tube, right? This stuff builds up over time. You can have a gradual type occlusion where this is just dried secretions that build up within the lumen of the trach. This is referred to as a cast within the trach. Or you can have something like a mucus plug that causes a more acute obstruction. Either way, the airway is blocked. What do you do? So first you take a stepwise approach. Put your patient on oxygen. Remember, these are not total laryngectomy patients. There is a connection between their mouth and their oral and their um, airway. So please, put them on oxygen and then remove anything that is at the end of this trach. Most commonly, it's going to be the speaking valve, but people come in with homemade flaps, all sorts of things over the end. Just take it off. If that relieves the problem, fantastic. Otherwise, moving on. If you have a single or double cannula type trach, you need to try and suction it out. If it is a double cannula, remove the inner cannula, first step, because all that buildup that might be obstructing the tube is in that inner cannula. When you take that inner cannula out, you may very well have relieved your problem, crisis averted. And then you go on to suction. If you're able to pass your catheter, fantastic. You know there's not a complete obstruction of the airway. You know there is some ability for air to move through that trachea, monitor the patient's breathing, assist the patient's breathing as you normally would. If the catheter does not pass, first thing you're gonna do is simply just move that trach just a little bit, rotate it a little bit, pull it out a centimeter, push it back in if it's part way out, because sometimes those trachs can actually occlude themselves on the wall of the patient's native trachea. And just a little repositioning may solve your problem, if you're lucky. If not, here's where things get a little bit more exciting. If the trach is inflated, deflate the cuff. Allow air to pass around the trach. Give, the, give it some space. Next, you have to take out the trach. That may seem counterintuitive. Someone has an airway problem, you're going to take out the definitive airway. But if the trach is what's causing the problem, the trach is what's got to go. If a trach is greater than seven days old, just one week, the, the trach will be mature enough that you can replace, take the trach out and replace it with another trach or an endotracheal tube of the size that looks appropriate for the size of the trach. If you are unlucky enough to have that trach be fewer than seven days old, if you take it out, the likelihood of you being able to replace something in that stoma is very low. Here's where you have to intubate orally. Again, there is a connection, intubate, and then remove the trach thereafter. And then supplement the patient's breathing as needed. Now, if you do need to supplement the patient's breathing when you've gotten that, remember there are, there are two exits for the air, right? You have the patient's mouth and the stoma. If you're going to bag valve mask, you need to cover the stoma, or you're going to have a very short ventilation loop, right, in the mouth, out the neck. If you're going to ventilate through the stoma, you need to actually cover the patient's mouth and nose, again, sort of contrary to what we do in everyday practice. And this is simply a pediatric mask over the stoma site, helping to ventilate that patient. So now, on to hemorrhage. Less frequent, much more dramatic, much more deadly. What we worry about in the emergency department is a tracheonominate artery fistula, and yes, it is just as bad as it sounds. A direct connection between the innominate artery of the aorta and your trachea makes for massive bleeding. And you can kind of see the anatomy, how that would work. She results in mass massive hemoptysis. The good news is it's rare. The bad news is it peaks two to three weeks after these trachs are placed, so just long enough for someone to go home and come back during your shift in the emergency department. Mortality, north of 90%. These are very rarely survivable, but the good news is that 50% of these patients have sentinel bleed. Half the time you get a warning. 
So if you remember nothing else from the six minute and 40 seconds of your life, I ask that you remember that all tracheostomy bleeds must have the source clearly identified, even if they stop by the, patient, by the time the patient gets to you. You can confirm with your eyes, you can see it, you can look with a scope or angiography, but either way you must find out where that bleeding came from. So if you're unlucky enough to have this happen during your shift, first thing you're gonna do is apply pressure, right? When something bleeds, we apply pressure. This pressure is a little different. You're actually going to press above the sternal notch and press posteriorly. If you do it gently to yourself, it's very, very uncomfortable. You're causing airway compression, but hopefully you're also compressing that artery. Of course, you're gonna mobilize your consultants, right? Definitive management is the OR or IR, if, that, if that's a better option than the OR for the patient, depending on their stability. The cuff that caused trouble, because often these fistulas occur because of pressure and necrosis from the cuff of the trachea, the one that caused all the trouble, now use it to your advantage. Overinflate it. Overinflate slowly. With slow inflation, these balloons can hold up to 50 cc's, 50 cc's of air. And that, while you're pressing back and the balloon's pressing forward, may result in tamponade. If that trach is greater than seven days old and it happens to be uncuffed, take it out. Again, feels counterintuitive. This patient has an airway emergency. They're breathing from their airway. I'm going to take out the definitive airway. Trach's got to go. You've got to compress that. Take it out. You can change it over a bougie if that makes you feel more comfortable. But then put in something with a cuff, a regular endotracheal tube, and again, slowly inflate that balloon. As long as you do it slowly, that balloon can hold up to 50 cc's of air, hopefully resulting in compression. Lastly, if, they, if you're very unlucky and that bleed happens in the first seven days after the trach is placed, you're going to have to intubate from above before you take that trach out because you could, again, lose the airway in a mess of blood and the stoma closing. So you're going to intubate. Once you pass that endotracheal tube from the mouth into the airway, you're going to take that tracheostomy out and use the balloon. Again, same principle. If all else fails, there's exactly one heroic measure in your toolbox, and it is heroic, and that is direct manual compression. I'm sure you've all, hold pressure, you've all held pressure on something, but probably never like this, right? It's messy, it's temporary, it's heroic, and I hope that none of you ever have to do it. But that's the last ditch effort to try and stop the bleed. So, bottom line, if your trach is occluded, suck it out. Sucking it out doesn't work, then take it out. If a patient comes in with bleeding from their trach, find out the source. Do not let that source of bleeding be unidentified because if the patient comes back with their massive bleed, it's too late at that point. And lastly, if you happen to be unlucky and get that massive hemoptysis patient, compress, compress with a balloon, compress with your fingers if necessary. Thank you very much.